about food preservation, there are three different options. Freezing, um, home canning, or drying of foods typically. So when we're looking at um, maybe with limited resources or possible power outages, we're not going to include freezing in today's discussion because freezing, although is very valid and very excellent for many things, and I do it all the time, um, for our purposes, we're going to focus on home canning and we're also going to focus on dehydrating of foods because I think those are the things you'll find the most helpful. And, and why can? Um, canning is a very reliable way to store food. It's really pretty easy. It is, can be overwhelming if you've never done it before and, and people will talk about, oh, what if the canner blows up or what if it explodes or and they have all these misconceptions about it. You know, truthfully, the problem with canning has very little to do with the way the canner is handled. Usually the problem with canning is that people don't follow standard recipes. So they don't follow a safe procedure. So I'll try to clarify that as I talk with you about canning. Again, um, when I talk about reliable sources of information, I think I'll start there and then I'll come back to it. It's that important. When you're looking for directions on how to can something, it's important that you go to a source that has had tested recipes, recently tested recipes, and the standard are either the Ball Blue Book, which I just got this new one. They're like $5.99, reasonably priced. They're available anywhere you find canning supplies. And the nice thing about them, lots of diagrams. They also get into freezing and they also get into drying but everything has been tested and retested, and it is considered the standard. Now, the, the university extension centers also, excellent information, and they work together, okay? And these are available free online, University of Missouri Extension, and they have several pamphlets that are available that you can print, download and print yourself, or if you have a university extension office near you. And they will also give classes that you might consider too if you're wanting to learn to can. And then I just discovered something just as I was doing research for this. I, I had a question about canning meats because someone had, I had not done it before. I knew that meats are low acid. You have to be very careful in how you do it and I wanted a standard recipe. As I started looking and talking to people about what they did, there were a lot of discrepancies and I thought, hmm. And I wanted to do some convenience foods. I thought, I'll work on that in the winter when I have more time, when all the garden produce isn't coming in, make some soups, stews, possibly some canned meats. But I wanted to be sure I had reliable recipes. Now, this, when you're mixing like vegetables, what they will tell you is process whatever you're mixing the length of time required by the um, vegetable that requires the longest period of time. For example, if you're mixing tomatoes and onions and peppers. If peppers take 40 minutes, then the whole mixture requires 40 minutes, where tomatoes wouldn't have taken that long by themselves. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. Okay, so I thought, if I do a soup, wouldn't that same thing be true? If there's a mix in it, I would process it for, or a meat, I would process it for the length of time the meat re would require. If not, you know, I'd choose the thing that required the longest time. So I ran that past the extension office and they said, no, that we don't recommend you do that. And we don't recommend you do this. And I kept saying, well, well can you explain to me why? And who does that testing? And, you know, what have, because they'll say, we've not tested that. So I, I followed the trail back, actually, and found out where all that testing done, is done. And it's the University of Georgia. They are the testing university for the USDA. So they set the standards. And the beauty of that, which I'm going to share with you, is there is a website that you can go to. And it is the National Center for Food Preservation, University of Georgia. And if you will just Google that, National Center for Food Preservation, that's what will come up, University of Georgia. And when you go to their site, they actually have an online training for canning, free video where you can can. And then this is their newest publication. It's a book, brand new, where they've been, they've reviewed a bunch, you know, more recipes for safe home canning processes. That is, um, I believe it was like $18. And it, it has a lot of recipes in it. However, if you are a brand new 
to canning, I would still go back to the ball blue book first because of the diagrams and the explanations. But if you're ready to take it a step further and you're wanting to see, you know, like all the different salsas, all the different pickles, all the different meats, possibilities that you can safely do with standard recipes, this is the next best thing. So just, I was so excited when I found that out because of all the years I can, I did not know where they got their information. So once again, it is the National Center for Food Preservation, University of Georgia, and you can find everything you want to know about home canning. Okay, so let me go back to this just a minute um, when I was talking about standard recipes and why that matters. And you'll find this very clearly explained in the Ball Blue Book. Um, when you are working with, with fruits or vegetables, either one, the way you choose how to process them has to do with their uh, pH value, whether they're, acid, they're acidic or low acid vegetables or, or whatever it might be. So like if things have a certain pH, you can simply boil the water around them. We call it a boiling water bath at 212 degrees. Again, you have to adjust for altitude, but typically. And um, then that would, they would be safely preserved and that would be true of anything high acid. And, and an easy way to remember that's all fruits are high acid. So if I'm making applesauce, I could do boiling water bath canner and then perfectly safe. Now, the other extreme, if I'm doing low acid, remember I mentioned meats, well meats, uh, potatoes, many of the vegetables, green beans, all those vegetables are considered low acid, which means that they, their core has to get up to a higher temperature, 240 degrees, for a certain amount of time to kill the bacteria within them. So that does not happen when you're just immersing them in boiling water. They need pressure added, okay? Now the one that falls kind of in the middle is tomatoes. It used to be that tomatoes were always done with boiling water bath. Many of the newer varieties are not as acidic as the old ones. So when you're looking at recipes, they will either say to add like lemon juice or citric acid or vinegar or something like that to raise the acidity and then boiling water bath or they will have you pressure can them for a short period of time. So keep that in mind, tomatoes fall right in the middle. But what I want to emphasize is the way bacteria grows, that's the whole critical thing with canning. The, the most dangerous uh, food poisoning from canning is the botulism, which you may have heard of, and it grows without air. So, say you have these canned green beans and they're sealed. You think they're perfectly safe, not just because they're sealed. That botulism does not require air to grow. So, if they have not been processed to get that inner temperature up to that 240 degrees for a standard length of time, you would not want to consume them. And you can't smell it, you can't see it. It's not like mold that grows on top of something. So, and it is pretty dangerous. So you're thinking, well, this is overkill. How often does that happen? Not often, but it is, it, it is life-threatening when it does. So I'm like, why take the chance? I still hear about people who will do, try to can in the oven, which is just awful. You just can't, it's just so dangerous to do it that way. Or they'll say, you know, I would never use a pressure canner. I boil everything in water. If I boil it long enough, it's good. My grandmother did it. My mother did it. And, and, and maybe so. And maybe that's a risk you want to take with your own family. But I would not do that. And products have changed. Like I said with the tomatoes. There are lo uh, lower acid tomatoes now. And, and as that has happened and more research has been done and more has been learned, why not take advantage of it and do it right the first time and then you can rest easy and, and not be concerned. Um, that pH level that makes the determination whether they're acidic or, or not is 4.6. So when they're tested, that's what they're going by. Um, and if you're mixing an acid in a low acid food, you treat it all as if it's low acid. Now what the other thing they told me when I called, I finally talked to them at, at or, or ask the question that was sent to the University of Georgia. I was asking about those mixtures of foods and convenience foods and meats. And they said that absolutely no thickeners are to be added to soups or um, any pasta product or noodles or anything like that. 
And I kept asking, why? You know, what would be the problem with that? Is it a quality product problem or is it actually a safety issue? And they said it's a safety issue. And the reason is because um, it, depending on how thick it is, there's no standard. So depending on how thick it is, the more dense foods, the inside doesn't get to that temperature for that period of time. And they said another problem was the fatty meats. So there's a little different standard for poultry than there is for like ground meat. Um, because of the fat in the meat. So do use your standard recipes. Okay, so let's go over some of the different equipment before we go further. If you are doing, um, say, applesauce or um, canned peaches or some sort of fruit that's high acid, the boiling water bath canner, it would work fine for you. And you don't even have to have an actual canner like this. You can convert a pot or you can, you can use your pressure canner too. Um, all you need is a rack in the bottom. These come with lift-out racks, and this one is ancient. I will tell you, I've had these for 30 years, so and I use them every summer. So they're a long-lasting investment. But they have a rack to lift the jars out, a lid. All that is required for a boiling water bath canner is a rack in the bottom and enough space at the top that you can put your jar down and it has at least like an inch or two of boiling water over the top. So it needs to be a deep pot, but if you have a rack, you can convert another pot and you don't need extra expense of a canner. Um, so again, anything low acid, you could do inexpensively. All you would need is a big pot, a funnel, highly recommended, a jar lifter, you need just, be, you've got to have that just because of the boiling water and the, that you're dealing with and the temperatures. But really, that's it. Your other investment is going to be jars and lids. If you are fortunate enough to have some passed down to you or even to find them at a garage sale, go for it. Um, the thing to check, though, is the top to make sure, absolutely sure, there are no nicks in the top of the jar. It needs to be perfectly smooth or you won't get a seal. And then, of course, if there are any cracks or anything. And it's funny, one of the big debates over the years has been waged on, can you, do you have to use the ball or Kerr jars? Those were the big manufacturers. Or can you use mayonnaise jars? And, of course, um, the manufacturers didn't want anybody using the mayonnaise jars because they weren't, they, they, they said they weren't the same quality and, and there was this thing going back and forth. Well, it's interesting that now the updated information, this is what they say. They still, the better quality are the actual canning jars, but that the others may be used if they don't have any nicks in the top, that there's no cracks, but that um, use them with care, which might mean that you would want to use them maybe without pressure in a boiling water bath, but under pressure that there might be breakage. So you are running the risk of a jar under pressure, the bottom breaking and losing the contents and having a big mess. But um, other than that, those jars are usable. Now, the thing is, most mayonnaise does not come in jars anymore. Everything's plastic, so it may not even be a big deal. But just if you're wondering about that. The thing to stay away from, well, the other thing that I should mention while I'm talking about jars is the lids. The standard in lids are the two-part lids. This is a wide mouth. They're more expensive than the narrow mouth. Lids are expensive, though. Um, this part cannot be reused. This part, take care of it and you can use it repeatedly. So the lid is sealed on. I can remove this, reuse it. And a wide mouth lid, again, is more expensive. So if you can get by with the narrow mouth jars, you're better off. Again, the same thing. Think about this. If my family's large family, I would usually use quartz. My most economical is going to be narrow mouth quart jars because every time you do a jar, you've got a new lid. So if you're doing everything in pints, you have more lids involved. Um, the thing you want to stay away from are the old, these are a couple of antique jars, they're beautiful, but these old lid, old style lids. This is better to do, use as I have done here. I've got some of my dried grains in there and they're beautiful, but they're not lids that you would reuse for canning. Now, I went, I went to canning supplies just last week because I was just curious about what was out there. And it's kind of interesting. There are other manufacturers of jars now. Either that or they are just, um, the, the original companies are producing 
some off-label jars that are less expensive, which jars had been quite expensive in recent years. But then there's like this division. There are the simple plain Jane jars, which are perfectly fine. And then there are all the fancy, um, more um, uh, crafts, gift giving, that category of canning jars and supplies, which are quite pricey. So you might find that when you're looking. And you know in certain areas where canning is done regularly, these things are easy to find. In other areas, they aren't. So you might keep your eyes open for them too. All right, so you've made your investment. You've got jars, you've got canner. And then the other thing you're going to need really with that has to do with food storage. And in my one year plan, I put a bucket of sugar. And I'm going to explain to you why I did that. Um, we hardly use any sugar in this house. We use primarily honey for sweetener. We don't use a lot of sweetener even at that. And honey stores forever, and I highly recommend honey. And you can can with honey, like if you're doing a fruit product or something. But sugar, I use heavily during canning season for sweetening of like apples and that sort of thing. So that's why I think it's important to have sugar on hand for more of a food preservation time. And it, so that's something you need to weigh yourself. Maybe your family uses white sugar and it's not an issue to you anyway. But in case you're wondering why I keep talking about nutrition and I included all that sugar, that's why I did it. Alright, so then let's look at the pressure canner. This one is ancient. One of my um, dreams is to have one of the All-American pressure canners that, that prepare the way it carries. The advantage of them is they do, don't have the rubber ring that has to be replaced every few years. And, but, but I wanted to show you this old, my old original one because I want you to know if you're going to do canning, you have access to produce and you're going to can. These things are expensive, but they last forever. This one I know is 35 years old. You can tell by the color. <laughs> and I have replaced the inside um, ring, but it is a workhorse. And I use this thing for canning. I also pull the inside out. I've got a heavy pot to cook soups and stews in or for cooking down apple butter or something that might stick. And they are just indestructible. I have replaced the gauge. I did that like, you know, three or four years ago. So it had been, you know, 25 years before doing that. Now, the, the other thing I want to tell you about with these is the extension office, the local extension office safety tests these for you. So like, in my case, mine is so old, or say you found one at a garage sale or used one somewhere and you weren't sure if it was safe. The extension office, and in our county, it's free. You make arrangements with them and they have a, a little machine, they put it on to see if your gauge is accurate. It is important that that gauge is accurate if you have a gauge type canner, but do know that the extension office, they are your best friend when it comes to this sort of thing. Free publications, testing, and if you have a question about the safety of something, they can tell you, lead you in the right direction. All right, I'm not going to go in, go through the actual process of canning something. I could, but it would, it would be a whole class in and of itself. And what I really recommend to you is that you go to that website I told you about. They have the videos and they will walk you through low acid canning, high acid canning, and then things like jellies and pickles. Jellies are very simple. They do use a lot of sugar. So you might keep that in mind with your sugar storage too. And then pickling products is a very safe, easy thing to do too. So again, directions are all online and you can do that. And the local extensions will offer classes certain times of the year inexpensively if you've never canned before. Home canning, highly recommended. Although, if you are purchasing all your produce, it will not be reasonable. If you are gardening or you have access to, to large quantities of produce, then it's a reasonable, um, it's worth your time and effort for the cost involved. Okay, so now let's move to um, dehydration because if you are a very small family, maybe you're working full time, you have very little time to devote to it and you're thinking, yeah, but I'd like to do something. Um, dehydrating may be an option for you. Um, it's very inexpensive. It's a nutritious way to do it. And, you know, for a lot of people, I think it's, it's the most practical. Now, 
there are different in the Midwest you almost always have to buy a dehydrator especially if you're doing very much in variety if you're in the Southwest a lot of sun low humidity you can do it outside um, do a solar dehydrating old kitchen ranges used to have pilot lights in their ovens and they would do it in the oven and that's one of the things when you read some the materials they refer to that the newer ovens don't have pilot lights so it's you can't get that temperature low enough and keep it consistent enough to do a good job drying. Um, microwaves can be used for herbs, but that's really all. And there are certain things like onions, garlic, that you've seen some peppers braided and just hanging that you can dry that way. And again, the old timers that had their wood cook stoves in the kitchen, they would hang some of those things around the stove and it would be real dry there. Um, our lifestyles are different, but we need to take what we can from them and adapt it for our own purposes. Um, okay, so let's look at what I'm talking about with the dehydrator. There are two basic styles, maybe three, but generally this is what you're going to find. This is a cheaper one, um, less expensive, but it, it will work. And I will tell you the advantages and the disadvantages of it. The problem, okay, this has a round trays. They're stacked trays. And there are several here. There's a fan in the bottom. Actually, this one doesn't have a fan. This just has heating coils. All right, and the heat travels up through it. And then I can open and close the venting on the top. Now, if I am drying just simple things, herbs, flowers, um, certain fruits and vegetables that are easy to dry, this will work, okay? The, but if you're doing jerky, if you're doing, um, like I like fruit leather, some of them are, and then certain vegetables, things that don't dry quite so quickly and easily, the problem with this is you don't have enough airflow because there's no fan on it, and it doesn't have a temperature control. So you've got one temperature, no air movement. It will work for certain things. So if your needs are very simple, these things are like $30. They're, they're very inexpensive. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other thing to work with, work around, is I like to do like fruit leathers and things, and I don't like working with this hole in the middle. That's a problem for me, and again, it may not matter to you. All right, so keep that in mind. Inexpensive, you don't have, air, you don't have a blower, and you don't have temp uh, temperature control on it. Okay, so then another one, this is the one I got two or three years ago, and this one ha is um, a different shape, which really the shape doesn't matter. Move something so I can show you more carefully. But what I do want you to see on here is it has the on-off switch, but it has a temperature control. And certain things need higher heat. If I was making jerky in it, um, certain vegetables that need a higher heat, I can adjust it there. All right, the other thing is there's a blower on it. And you can't really see this in the bottom. All you can see is the remains of the basil that I did most recently that has fallen down. But there is a blower in the bottom. And then again, you have the trays. And these are rectangular trays, and there are a series of them. I'll show you the top. They look like this, and they have removable plastic trays that you can take out and wash. And then they also have um, smaller solid trays that, like if you're doing a fruit leather or something, you could do. Now, I've really liked this dehydrator. It does a good job. I do rotate trays from top to bottom. You would do that on the other one, too. Um, it seems to do an even job of, as, as far as like airflow and all that. Now, for fruit leathers, I don't, and I don't have a little tray in here with it. I think I just took them out totally because they were kind of in the way. What I do is put just saran wrap down and spread my mixture on top of that. And then after it's dried some, I peel the saran wrap off and let it continue drying. Because if you didn't use something, it would drip through when you're using a liquid like that. The other thing I don't like about this is the blower in the middle. And again, you have to work around that. Now, the top of the line is usually considered to be the Excalibur brand. And it is, this one is about $120. It is more like the $200 range. 
and I am fairly certain that it does not have that center blower. I think it the, the air flows in from this side. Um, but that would be something to check out if that's something you're going to use heavily. And if that matters to you, and it may or may not. Okay, they, so they're very, they're not expensive. Um, they're easy to clean, easy to use. I want to show you some of the things that you can do with them. They always come with books that have all kinds of ideas. But the ball blue book in the back, and also in this book in the back, there are all kinds of ideas there too. So like if you're thinking, ha, oh, I've got this thing and somebody said I should use it, what do I do, really do with it? Go to one of these references. And like certain things are easy to do. Certain things have to be pre-treated to keep them from browning. Other things do not. Some things you can just, you can just um, cut them up and put them on the, the trays. I mentioned in one of my equipment um, lessons earlier about using a, a grater, a hand grater. You need something to get your pieces consistently sized so that they will dry evenly. That's the only really key there. So some sort of a mandolin or a, a grater or a slicer of some sort to get consistent sized pieces for drying would be important. But other that, than that, it's really an easy thing to do. I did some um, cucumber chips and these would be good to eat with that bean dip that I did earlier. So you have a vegetable chip that are dried and like when they ask, you ask like how long will something like this last. I'm going to use these quickly so I just used a, a plastic lid. If I was going to save them for like six months to a year I would use my vacuum sealer, pull that air out and then um, store them in a cool dark place. Now this is a whole head of cabbage. I had cabbage everywhere coming out of my garden this summer and just couldn't work it up quickly enough. So I cut up a whole head of cabbage and it fit in this one quart jar, dehydrated. And how am I going to use it? I use cabbage in my vegetable soup in the winter. So I have my um, soup mix, my broth going, and I just dump in some of the cabbage and it will reconstitute as it cooks and it's very tasty. And again, I'm planning to use it this winter, so I just simply have a screw lid on the jar. Now this is the fruit leather that I was telling you about. This, oh, your children will love this stuff. It is. It would be a great gift, in fact. I do um, two parts or three parts applesauce to one part raspberry or blueberry. Now I did not take the seeds out of this, and that might not be acceptable to you. You can strain the seeds out. I just, did, it didn't matter to me and I didn't, but um, I did these in the size piece on each side of my, my dehydrator tray and then I rolled them up and I put them in this jar. Now I keep this in the refrigerator. I wouldn't have to, it depends on how long, that's with home dehydrating, it doesn't get as dry as it does because when you purchase like canned dehydrated foods, they'll say these are the ones that last, you know, 15 or 20 or whatever years, but they can get up to 97% of the moisture out. You can't do that when you home dehydrate. So things you have to watch a little more carefully, but you just watch to be sure that they haven't molded, they haven't picked up any moisture where they're, you know, they're, you can feel the moisture on them. Um, and, and they're fine. The thing you would watch for would be that or mold or something like that. Otherwise, you're not going to have a problem with them. So it's more like, oh, that product's wasted. After all that time, I need to throw it out. It's not so much that you have to be worried about eating something that could hurt you. So again, it's, it's um, you just kind of have to weigh your goal and how long you're going to store it. I keep this in the refrigerator because I, I don't use it that often mainly for grandchildren or for fun times or to take with us. So um, just because I don't know how long I'll have it, I do store it in the refrigerator. But you can put it in a pretty jar, you can give it as a gift. And you can do, like you can do apple cinnamon, you can do all sorts of fruit leathers. You can do tomato leather. You can do, um, one idea is to do like cream soups and do them like a, a leather. Or you can just put a spoonful on your drying tray and dry them and then put them down in a thermos with boiling water and you have instant cream soup. And those are things that if there's, if you're living alone and you're in an apartment and you're thinking, you know, I, I don't have space for a lot of things, 
this will help you can do this without using a lot of space dried foods shrink you can do it without expensive equipment and you can do it in small quantities at a time you can fill this these trays part of it can be fruit part of it can be herbs part of it can be your leftovers that you're drying that you want to save for soups for some for a later time so um, lots of versatility there and I think that's something that people underuse jerkies the meats can be done this way um, and there are specific directions for that too and again go back to one of these standard books the ball blue book or something that would probably be your simplest or your extension office also has freebies on that online and because there are certain things you need to do to make sure that the jerky it is a safe product to use but it's not hard and it's not expensive much less expensive than the jerky that you might purchase and the thing about doing your own is you can control. If you don't want salt in a product, you're needing low salt, you can do that. If you're wanting to reduce the amount of sweetener, or if you're wanting to avoid just certain mixtures, you have that control when you're doing your own. Okay, once again, um, the three kinds of basic, when you're talking about home, home food preservation, it would be freezing, it would be canning, and it would be food drying. So if you're a small family, probably the drying is the place to start. If you have access to lots of produce or fruit or whatever, then you can move on to the canning. But like if you're thinking, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with pickles or jellies, you don't even need to do the canner. You can start with a boiling water bath, which could be a stock pot that you've adapted. So again, there's not a lot of expense involved that. In that so what I would recommend to you is that you start small practice find out what you use and then be on the lookout for good prices for things or or ways to adapt your recipes to make use of what you've done because if you do all that work and then don't use it then then you know it's kind of wasted time I'm, I'm really serious about people being practical and that the things they do in their food storage work now as well as later we want them in case you need them later but we want things that your family will eat now and that you will enjoy now that give nutrition to your diet now as well as later.